quite exciting. Um, a lot of people are into the same types of things these days. I think it's basically science and art and the convergence of science and art. And people in this field, you know, you'll hear lots of generative artists talking about being inspired by nature. And actually, this is being inspired by science, I think, is is nothing new. Artists were all, in, you know, 400 years ago, artists would have to rely on their own eyes and ears. They'd look out the window, they'd see a landscape, they'd see a sky, and, and they'd paint it. Today, we have the tools to look at the world, not through our own eyes, but through the tools of science. And we can, you know, the way, actually Richard Feynman says it perfectly when he, he has, in one of his um, talks, he talks about the flower and how an artist might look at the flower and paint the flower. And he says, but as a scientist, I think about the beauty on a cellular structure. I think about how that flower photosynthesizes, takes the energy from the sun, and in turn becomes part of this chain. So it's all of those things. One thing right now that I'm really obsessed with is complexity from simplicity. The, um, you know, I think the whole world is based on this, our very existence, you know, evolution, life itself is something which in, which is incredibly complicated but it came from simplicity and it came from rules and just with the interaction of these different simple rules you can create really really complicated things and that's what i'm really interested in pendulums there's um, a classic physics experiment where you take loads of pendulums they have different string lengths and then you just let them go and every single pendulum has a completely fixed oscillation it just goes back and forth back and forth and every single one has a different time and these things go in and out of sync and it's just you can think of it as a very very simple but multi-channel polyrhythm where look so what I'm trying to do in this series of projects is take these principles and then look at ways of revisualizing it or sonifying it and really distilling it down to its essence. Because when you look at the extra to my side, if I see a light flashing, I can guess that, okay, it's flashing, say, every second. That, that's the period. But if, if it's not perfectly regular, if there's a few millisecond uh, variances in the, in the frequency of it, I'm not going to be able to pick this up. I'm going to say, yeah, I think it's about regular. But if I'm hearing a beat, then I can sense that, oh, that that beat was like a few milliseconds off. And we have these things kind of programmed into us. So if you play with that, when, you're, when you take some data and you extract these patterns, and then you flip those patterns from being visual patterns to sound patterns, or from sound patterns to visual patterns, or you take a pattern, you have a subject that you want to explore, but you don't know what the story is you want to tell. You, the story that you want to tell unfolds as you explore the subject so it really stands out so what happens is you get these pulses and then those pulses are in sync and then they go out of sync and then they come back into sync so there's often say what i like to do is create these imaginary uh, universes and these imaginary universes share one thread of connection with the real world but everything else is is imaginary and it creates an unfamiliar familiarity, and I really like that. You look at it and you notice there's something in there that I recognize, but I don't know what it is. So that forces... When a project has arrived, and that's obviously that's a classic difficult one, isn't it? Do you mean like when I'm happy and it's done? That's usually a deadline. Um, I'm able to finish projects now. Um, I've learned to say that's done. I think it's just... Yeah, I don't, I don't really have a criteria. I just look at it and go, right, done. I used to try to cram everything into a project, even look at a project I did two years ago and say, oh, it's not finished, and try to rework it. Um, but now I've kind of learned to say, no, that is finished. It's representative of what I was, where my mind was at two years ago. Any new ideas that I have go into the new project. And if I don't like where it's got, got to, I call it a sketch or a study instead of a project. If I like it, I call it a project. Maybe that's cheap, but it, it works for me. Would you describe yourself for you? Uh, a maximalist, what's a maximalist? Like opposite of minimalist, I guess, but.
I would describe myself now definitely as a minimalist. I don't know if that comes across in my work, um, probably not, but uh, but some, it's something along the lines of keep everything as simple as it needs to be, but no simpler. Um, and I really love this. another quote that, another phrase that's really common is keep it simple, right? Keep it simple, stupid, kiss. And I hate that phrase because it's a victim of its own saying. I've seen people oversimplify and kill what they're trying to create. And uh, I cannot tell it's, the piano is incredibly complicated under the hood, um, but it needs to be that complicated to provide the simple interface. So the interface is really, really simple. But to provide that simple interface, you need a complicated solution. But the complicated solution is probably as simple as it needs to be, but no simpler. If you simplify that solution that's under the hood, you're compromising the simple interface on the outside. So the, I like to keep things as simple as possible, but that can still be quite complicated if, to, you know, to get the results that I want to get. So what MSA stand for? Mega super awesome. Actually, MSA is my initials. Um, Mehmet Selim Akten is my full name. And many, many years ago when I was, um, I was trying to come up with a name for, because I registered a company, um, it's just me. It's trying to come up with a name and it's hard to come up with a name. So I came, somehow, as all good ideas, the idea came to me while I was sitting on the toilet. And I thought, uh, yeah, mega super awesome visuals company. MSA is my initials, blah, blah. So um, MSA became my kind of thing, you know, like my namespace, if you will, for the geekers, etc. So that's MSA Fluid, MSA Physics, MSA OpenCL, everything. Um, it's like the OF or the CI for Cinder or the P5 what processing was a long time ago. Yeah, that's where MSA comes from. And so you're... Um, I studied civil engineering at university in Istanbul and I, it was kind of a, I kind of had to kind of thing. And uh, it, it's again, so representative of nature. It's one of those things like fractals, you know, you simulate it in a computer and it's like, whoa, it's endless things that you can do with it and it influenced on me. It's basically Pong, uh, but it's set in this really psychedelic fluid simulation environment. It basically, the fluid demo that I did uh, was a homage to that. And you're playing Pong, you're shooting the balls, and it's going through fluids, creating things, and then you can create vortices in the fluids, and it's just fully triptastic, it's pretty cool. So, I'll spiel. And so when I got into computer vision, I wanted to, like, wouldn't it be cool if you could do this and have all these psychedelic fluids and particles and that kind of stuff? So I reached out to where I would take an optical flow analysis of a video feed, stick it into a fluid simulation, then the fluid simulation would, ad would advect particles or other objects. And Tony, I want to think, I want to say, create a fluid. I want to say, add a force at this position. I want to say, get force at this position or get velocity. I want to say, add color at this position. So I made them, I made this hammer and I use that hammer to make body paint. Now what, what I release, I don't want body paint, I don't want 100 people making body paint, I want people to use the hammer that I created to create their own tools. Or what's even better is to take my hammer, make their own sculptures and then give me back a new hammer which is improved, which happened actually. It's not really a big mistake, but what happened is people, a lot of people, didn't really delve into the library as much as I would have liked them to. They just basically used MSA Fluid as is. Um, and it became kind of synonymous with multi-touch demos. Like every single multi-touch table or wall I've seen has the MSA Fluid demo that I wrote, which is fine. Um, but I wish um, I, that people would actually dig into the code and try to understand and make something of their own. One MSA fluid, like they didn't feel the need to attribute it to me. And at that point, my brain just kind of, maybe I'm reading too much into it. And, but it felt like an anonymous folk song. Like they was like, oh, it, it became so ubiquitous that 
it is like that's MSA fluid. It has no author. That's just MSA fluid. It it has always been there. You know, a bit like the ancient songs, which no one knows who wrote them. They just pass from tongue to tongue. And I really like that idea of software as this anonymous cultural um, meme. And I don't mean meme in the internet sense. I mean it in the Dawkins sense. Um, I really, really love that idea. And I don't have the right to complain because I release it as open source. When I release it as open source, it is out there. I have no control over what people do with it. So um, I, I, I have no complaints. But, but nowadays when I release tools, and I spend a lot of time when I release a library, I, I do spend a lot of time trying to make the API easy to use, documenting it and creating easy to use examples. I try to make the examples not too pretty uh, because I've realized if you make it too pretty, you're encouraging laziness. And I shops for that. So my approach is release tools, document it well, release really minimal, simple examples which show you how to use particular features of the library and then give lectures and workshops to show people how to bring it together. Because personally, as a... Um, so I had an installation there, a 50-foot tent, um, and projected all around the inside this MSA fluid. You could see yourself, infrared camera, amongst the fluid, and then you'd do this, and the fluid would go, and it, it'd also make music, so pretty tri trippy. And uh, one girl came up to me, because I was there, and she kind of knew it was my project. She's like, how does it work? And I said, well, there's... Um, you know, six infrared cameras up there. I pointed up and she looked up like, wow, is that my aura? And I thought, Sh I could say, yes, it is your aura. Or I could say, it's an optical flow algorithm affecting an Navier-Stokes simulation. So I chose the latter because I thought it'd be a more engaging conversation. But um, I think, yeah, the reason why it works is the je ne sais quoi is because it appeals to people on many levels. It appeals to the the math geeks, the physics geeks, the people who love um, science, who love abstracting science and nature. But it also appeals to people who are the complete opposite, people who don't want to think about science but want to think about magic and spirituality and um, and tripping and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's a big spectrum there. It covers... Um, and so we... I'm not spiritual at all, but I think, I don't even know what it means to be spiritual, but I think if, depending on how you define it, it is the same thing. Like it's, um, it's just an appreciation for being alive and nature and what surrounds us. And then you can find different ways of trying to explain this, but um, it's kind of talking about what I, what blows my mind about mushrooms, well, hallucinogenics in general, but mushrooms being my favorite because it's so controllable, is you don't just trip out. You you actually have a heightened sense of understanding of, of, of your surroundings. Um, I mean, I remember so many times just sitting, just staring at wood, like sitting, sitting at the table and the tiny cracks in the wood are just these massive canyons. And you're not just imagining, like it's not, Hallucinating is one thing, which is which is great fun, but when you see detail in the world that's actually there, that is you don't notice, um, you know, when you're sober, that's just an incredible thing because it just raises so many questions. It raises the fact that a there's so much out there that we're unaware of, which we already know, but it underlines that. But also that we are actually capable of that. Like I often think. Isn't it a shame that we can't just always do that? One example, I noticed it, but at that point in time, I was hearing every single layer of the song spatialized, like in, like the voice was here, the drums was here, that was there, it had complete synesthesia anyway, but it evolved to be like that. But we've kind of reached a point where, because we're kind of clever, we're going against evolution. Um, and we can do things that aren't necessarily evolutionary advantageous, but just what we want to do. So I don't do, I wouldn't call what I do, say, a psychedelic art in that what I do 
work-wise is not inspired by in any way you know trips or hallucinogenics that's the whole other field which i enjoy but it's not what i do but in the broader sense i would say yeah that there's definitely a common a commonality in just looking at the world in different ways and trying to see things which are there but that we don't see that are just invisibly rubbish. Like if that's the electromagnetic spectrum, radiation spectrum, you know, we can only see about that and, you know, pressure waves, it would be really rubbish as, as sensors. Um, and there's ways to expand that. You can use tools of science and technology or you can use, you know, tools of nature like mushrooms or something. And well, I actually wanted to be a musician before a visual artist, or rather, I, al I always wanted to do both. Like, I uh, think it's, uh, actually, I'll tell you who my real inspiration is. Um, and I, I used to show this in my talks, Tom and Jerry, because um, as a four-year-old, I didn't know about Norman McLaren or Oscar Fissinger. What I knew was Tom and Jerry. And, you know, every movement, do it, do it, do it, do it. and I used to show, I, I probably still might show um, clips from Tom and Jerry. Uh, one particular clip that I used to show was where they were ice skating and every movement has this amazing score, but the score is so well composed to the movement that you don't actually even hear music. It just becomes the sound of the movement. And so that completely inspired me also, obviously Fantasia. Uh, I, what kid didn't blow, get blown away by Fantasia? Um, life, right? I mean, if every time you touch something, there, there's a sound associated with it. So if you're creating a fictional universe, um, and I, you know, you're creating these connections, that's one of it. Or not. I mean, if you omit sound, that that's still sound design. You know, if if there should have been a sound but there isn't, that's still a very very conscious thing to do. So so. Um, I guess I'm interested in both. I wanted to be a musician. In fact, I moved to England to become a kind of musician. Um, but I could never decide between music or visual arts, and I loved both. And that's why projects like Simple Harmonic Motion are really close to my heart, because it's a true um, synthesis of both. And was there ever a In the sense that I would fluctuate, like I would spend a few years doing one thing, that would take precedence. And then, uh, like, before this current stint of doing, um, say, visual, you know, more visual based or media art stuff, uh, I was more focused on music. And, like, I toured for a couple of years. And during that period, I wasn't actually producing any visual work. I was just kind of touring and gigging. And that got really frustrating. So then I, I said, okay, stop and I, so I quit that band that I was in and went back to this and prior to that band I was doing more visual stuff and then it got to a point where I'm not making enough music I feel really frustrated so I you know set up got in a band it was kind of overlapping and the band took over because these things are time consuming I mean they take over your life um, and now again with I'm trying to, to stitch it together from the visual side the engineering, that's never been uh, an issue because it's not, I don't want to be an engineer. The engineering facilitates to some degree. I use what I need to use of the engineering, uh, not so much in the music, but in what I do. Um, it's just problem solving, really. Um, I, I, think, I think I'm quite fortunate in that I started early. Like, I started programming when I was about 10. So um, it's not around anymore. It's a book designed for kids to learn how to pro uh, to understand computers um, how they work it has like goblins and dragons explaining what a gpu is what what a sound processor is what ram is pixels frame like hardcore stuff stuff which i would show in a workshop to a bunch of um, you know to post grads it, it's really amazing hardcore stuff so my first programs were from that book in those days, you know, this was 85, 1985, I was 10 years old. You have a computer, you want to play games. To play a game, you need to put a cassette in, fast forward to the correct, because you'd have this, you'd put all the games on this cassette, 
and it would have a, a, a counter. So you'd have to rewind, reset it to zero, and then look, oh, the game I want to play is Chuck Yeg. Chuck Yeg starts at 337. So fast forward to 337. So you have to understand what's going on here. You have to understand that there's data that's on the magnetic tape, and you have to fast forward to the bit where the data for Chuck Yeg is. And then you have to, um, I, have, I forget, you have to type, you have to press play, and then you have to type load, and then it would load. So you have to understand, and it, while it was playing, it would be a doing all the sounds. So, you know, you get an understanding of this. And then also you have to type load, and then you run. So then it was quite a natural to say, well, what else can I type? I can type, what can I type? I can type print, I can type list. I can say, oh, go to, I can do envelope, I can do peak, I can do poke. So it's like, I was obsessed with Lego until that point. And then all of a sudden, here's this thing, which is, it's not real like Lego, but it blows Lego out of the water. So that's how I started. And all programming really, it's just a way of thinking. And pro so it's problem solving. And it's the case of putting down your thoughts into steps and then thinking, is that valid? Is that not valid? Is that, how does it branch? I think it's a good exercise for people. Like um, even on a non-programming context, this kind of education should be given to people because I think it's, it's helpful in life in general. You know, even uh, you know, from a self-help point of view, where am I in my life? Where do I want to be? How do I get there? What do I have to do? Um, I don't do any of that, by the way. I wish I did. But um, so, yeah, because I've been doing that since I was 10, um, the brain's adjusted, I think, to being quite pragmatic and rational. What was there as you see I wrote this software that simulated um, hacking into NASA and I would show my parents look I've hacked into NASA so I'd run the program and this prompt would come up and then it would say um, it would ask you my name and I'd write my name and then I, I was so proud of this I'd write my name like Memo Acton and then it would ask my sex I choose my sex and then it would say welcome Mr. Acton and I'm like look I said I was male, so it knows to call me Mr. and not Miss. Um, and then it would draw, I would say, load blueprints, and it would draw the blueprints of a spaceship. And to me, this was like, I've hacked into NASA. Um, actually, I wanted to be a filmmaker, and that's where all this started, but I had no access to a camera, so, but I had a computer, so this was like a window into a virtual universe. And that's actually a problem, like obviously, Partners always hate computers, right? So I have a big thing with my wife where you're always on your computer. What are you doing? You're always on your computer. It's like, it's not a computer. It's a window into this other universe of where in that universe, I am God. Like, it's true, right? As a programmer, it's true, right? As a programmer, you are God of this universe that this portal goes into. So um, read into that what you will, but how is that not a creative outlet, right? That's the biggest creative outlet there is. <laughs> what I, what really excites me is this notion of there are things out there that we can sit and consume for hours, for, for time, for like time isn't um, relevant. Like sitting on the example that I gave and I often give is like sitting on a, a cliff looking at the ocean and there's something about that experience that can last forever. And I, I'm just really, I like to think, how can that be recreated? Are there ways of creating moments that, that there is no story? I mean, you could argue about it is, you can listen to a song a thousand times and, and never get bored. Um, you can have a song on loop for like years and every time you listen to it, it takes you somewhere. Whereas you don't really watch a film a thousand times, you know, no matter how much you love the film, you don't watch it that many times because the film generally takes you to the same place every time and really inspires me. Like, how can you make an experience that someone can come for 30 seconds, someone can come and enjoy it for, for an hour, They're, it doesn't have a beginning and an end, um, and they can keep coming back to it. So that's one motivation that I like to explore. 
I say, okay, so start moving and gather up, go around, create swirls, uh, you know, start quivering. I want to express fear, I want to express solitude, I want to express different emotions. So it's a very abstract narrative. It's a journey through different emotions is, is what you can't really call it a film. It's, it's, it's a bunch of lines, basically. But I'd like to anthropomorphism. Like, this film is just a bunch of lines. They're, they're ribbons flying around. And A, I kind of want it to be aesthetic because that's what inspired me. So, you know, I, I like the, that I want it to look pretty, if you will. But also, upon watching it, so that's where the time axis becomes really important because you could, by using time, can I make someone become emotionally attached to what is a bunch of lines? And that, hear the music, it's an instrument. You, you know, it's like playing an instrument. You want to react this, um, create a feedback loop between the system and yourself. So for me, that project, it just it was just great. Listen to the music, swell, go up, you know, come down, settle, quiver. Let's start sending them around. Um, it's like commanding an army. So I do that as well. It's good fun. That's it, yeah. Cool.